Hello everyone and thank you for stopping by today. We're going to talk about how to maximize your profits while avoiding some substantial losses in your real estate investments using two, wait for it, fun fundamental concepts. So my name is Jade and I'm with Legendary Real Estate Services, but we'll get right in. All right, two fundamental concepts we need to talk about. One is the real estate cycle and the other is the absorption rate. Now they don't sound like much, but when you put it all together, it's a huge eye opener to the huge real estate market as a whole and really seeing the big picture and the big waves and the big moves coming. So let's get right in. All right, the real estate cycle. So who should care about the real estate cycle? Well, buyers, sellers and investors and even developers. Now I'm going to lump everybody as investors because whether you're a professional investor or you're just a private owner or, or, or soon to be owner, you're investing a lot of money and a lot of time. In fact, it's one of the hugest, biggest investments you'll make in your life. So everyone is an, inver is an investor and therefore should really be conscious and cognizant of the real estate cycle. Now, why should you care about the real estate cycle? Well, let me ask, hypothetically, would you have rather bought some real estate in 2004, mind you, the peak of the market was about 2006, or in 2007, after the peak, when the rumbles started and the house of cards started shaking and, and right before the plunge? Probably 2004, right? Guess what? I did both. So definitely timing is everything, not just with acquisitions, but when you're disposing of your property, it's much better to dispose at near or around the top than after the avalanche. And when everyone is trying to get rid of their property, it's undervalued, um, you've lost some equity. Refinancing is the same thing too. It's a lot easier to refinance when the market is strong and, and just really vibrant then obviously in a downturn when lending standards are very tight and banks are reluctant to, to, to give those uh, loans unless under the strictest of circumstances. Even developers, they live and die by that real estate cycle because they put so much time and investment into the gestation of that property that it's literally just it's not life or death, but it is for a potential profit. Now, when do you want to care about it? I would suggest about once a quarter. You can do get away with once a year if you want to, but I like to look at it once a quarter. And here's why. Because there are subtle shifts month to month, but to see the bigger picture it, it, and to feel the shift in nuances, the change in tides, because when you know something is shifting and changing, you can make moves to prepare yourself while that change is still a mile away, vice when the wave is just upon you and, and now you're sprinting to get out of that way and make those moves. So that's why I say about once a quarter. Now here's the overall real estate cycle. You can look uh, it up. This 18 year cycle goes back. You can trace it back all the way to the 1800s and it happens over four stages. Now I say 18 years because that's the consistent average. You're going to have to give or take a few years if you do the, the math or, and look and look at it for, for wars, depressions, recessions, and even pandemics. So that's going to move the, the, the time frame by a few years. But 18 years is the consistent uh, time frame. And again, it's over these four stages, recovery, expansion, hypersupply, and recession. And what it really is, it's a story depicting supply and demand, the balances and the various stages of the, of the imbalances. So for example, um, everyone, uh, everyone is familiar with supply and demand and what happens when there is a huge demand and very short supply? You guessed it, prices go up. Now how do prices go down? When demand is low, and supply is abundant. 
That's when prices go down. And that's the same thing that happens to real estate housing prices. So in a recession, I'm going to start there. We have almost zero demand. People want nothing to do with it. They're scared. They have, you know, some people might be in hardship or they just want to wait out the storm. But supply is actually in excess because developers had started developing properties and it takes long gestation, years of gestation to get through and it's finally come online. So there's an abundance of supply and very low demand, which is why prices become depressed. Now, recovery phase it, it initially starts with low prices and very low demand, but the economy is is grinding through it. It's getting its its feet under it. And so confidence is slowly building. And so as confidence goes up, which happens when we have low unemployment, people have stable, reliable jobs, they're building up, uh, they have stable income, they're building up their savings, they're spending more, the economy becomes more and more confident. So buyer demand start, starts to creep up and therefore prices with it. But we haven't really hit momentum until we hit this point. And at this point, that's when demand is strong. Demand is set and supply isn't there to support the rising surge of that demand. And that's what causes those prices to start slowly inching up for more and more and more and, and beginning to accelerate. Now the tipping point here, it's interesting. It's like a game of the, the haves and the haves not in the sense of all the people that bought, they have, they're, they're happy, they're celebrating their purchase, their real estate, everyone's high-fiving. And all the people that haven't gotten in yet, they're getting FOMO, they're, that fear of missing out. And now they're jumping in. But at this point, prices have st- are, are nearing or at the peak and supply, the pipeline of supply is now really kicking in. And that's when we move into hyper supply because there's a balance point, a tipping point where supply is now meeting that demand. And when supply meets that demand, now we're in an equilibrium. Prices are still going up because just that market momentum, that hype is still going with it. But supply is slowly, slowly uh, flooding that market, which is that hyper supply phase. And then all of a sudden demand is satiated, but supply is still coming online, even right through, unfortunately, the recession phase. And then we're back down in the recession and the cycle starts over and over and over again since the 1800s this has been going on in the real estate market which is kind of cool because it's one of the few commodities where you can see that wave coming if you know what to look for so there are two key questions to determine which phase we are in and the first one now I'm going to go, I'm going to just speak about it. I'm not going to go into it is if you study classical real estate, these are the terms you're going to hear. What is the rental occupancy rate and where is it moving? The occupancy rate is just how fast space, real estate space is being occupied. And the other is where are rent prices? Are they increasing or decreasing? Where's the occupancy in relationship to the long-term occupancy average and that's how you know if prices are going up or going down again i'm not going to get into these because it's it's a convoluted subject that that requires a lot of internet sleuthing so instead i'm and there's not a lot of data just a hardcore pools of uh, strong clean data to support it so therefore that's why i'm substituting it with the absorption rate Now, is the absorption rate going up or is it going down? And you can find the absorption rate in in any MLS, the local multiple listing uh, services that real estate agents or brokers, they have access to, they pay their annual subscriptions so they can look at this anytime they want. The other question, the core, so the absorption rate is a proxy for rental occupancy rate. So it's a good proxy. It's not the same, but it accomplishes just about the same thing. And instead of rent prices, we're going to look at where, uh, where are housing prices? Are they going up? Are they going down? 
So those are the two key questions we need to determine which phase of the real estate cycle we are in. All right, so let's just get into it. What's the absorption rate? I, I spent some time talking it up. Now let's just dive into it. So the absorption rate is really the rate at which homes are sold in a particular area over a particular time frame. Basically, it's it shows you how quickly, as the name says, how the, quickly the market is absorbing the current inventory of supply. Are properties coming online on a Friday and then under contract that same day or, or that weekend? Or is properties in general sitting on the market? That's what that absorption rate tells us. It basically gives us a sense of the liquidity. Now, why should we care about it? Because the absorption rate can tell us what kind of market are we in? Are we in a seller's market? Are we in a buyer's market? Or are we in a neutral market? That's what that tells us. And also, it's one of the indicators we can use to ascertain what phase we're in in the overall real estate cycle. All right, now months of inventory. Okay, so realtors, brokers, they refer to the absorption rate as months of inventory. It's the same thing, but technically it's really not. Here's why. Imagine for a moment that we have a thousand properties online right now, active listings. If all active listings stop, meaning no new, more, no new properties came online for an indefinite period of time, how long would the market take to absorb that inventory? That's the months of supply. It's calculated in almost the exact same way. The equation is flipped. Real estate agents, they, it's like, they call it the absorption rate, but it, it's really not. So how do we calculate it? We need three variables. We need a particular time frame that we want to look at. We need uh, the number of sold transactions in that time frame in a particular area. And we need the number, the total number of active listings in that area. So say, for example, we have a thousand listings, active listings, and over the last month, which is our time frame, we had 250 sold transactions. Simple math. All we have to do, take 250 divided by a thousand, and we get a 25% absorption rate. Now, months of inventory. It's the same thing, but it's not. And this is why, because it's the amount of inventory divided by the number sold, which gives us four or four months of inventory. So uh, you'll hear you'll 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 hear those real estate agents and brokers talking about them. Um, you know, bless their hearts. Um, but you know, and I know that it's different. But we know what they're talking about, so we're gonna go with it. All right. So how does this tell us? if we're in a buyer's market or a seller's market. Well, let's back up just a bit. What is a seller's market? Again, this is just about supply and demand. What happens in the seller's market is the amount of demand exceeds the available supply. Simple as that. And we know we're in a seller's market if the absorption rate is above 20% or we have less than four months of supply of inventory. Now here, see, this is what I'm talking about. This is from the, uh, our, uh, our Metro MLS. They call it the absorption rate, but we know you and I know it's actually months of inventory. Okay. So this is the months of inventory of single family homes in Walworth County. So as you can see, even all the way back to July of 2020, we've been at less than four months of inventory. So what does that mean? We've been in a seller's market at least since July of 2020. Now, so how does absorption rate tell us that we are in a buyer's market? Well, let's step back again. What's a buyer's market? It's the exact opposite of a seller's market. It's when buyer demand is low and supply is in excess. And we know we're in a buyer's market. If the absorption rate is below 15% or we have more than six months of inventory on hand. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
what happens if the market is above four months but below six? See, I got you. I know what you're thinking, and, I, and I'll explain that. That's when we have a balanced market. Now, the National uh, Association of Realtors, they also keep great strict data, and, and I love the things that they put out as far as um, data is concerned and what they do with it. They say that a balanced market is when we have about five months of inventory on hand. Okay, so I want to dig into this 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 chart with you just briefly but it's very interesting it tells there's more to it when you really look at it as you can see we had a huge the the covid pandemic it caused a huge acceleration deeper into that seller's market through the end of the year and then something happened the market decelerated it leveled off and it switched directions within the last uh, few months, it peaked in March. The seller's market, the height of the seller's market in Walworth County, four single family homes, peaked in March of 2021. And that's when the market shifted and it started slowly but surely accelerating. Now make no mistake, we're still in a seller's market, but you see how the sentiment is shifting, which is why I say we should look at this once a quarter because it took a quarter to see, okay, seller's market, Ooh, deeper seller's market. Ooh, shift. Okay, something's happening. And what was happening is, you know, buyers were getting burnt out. A lot of buyers were saying, you know what? I am not paying over asking price. This is crazy. And all the sellers on the sideline who had it, who were too afraid to list their homes are just not ready. They're like, man, I want to get on this action. So, so buyer demand waned and a huge, um, uh, seller confidence started flooding the market. So it was a combination of all three uh, just really started shifting that market dynamic, which is kind of cool to, to just watch and geek out to. Well, it is for me. Anyways, all right. So let's let's bring it all together. Now, what do we know so far? We know that there are four stages of the real estate market cycle. We also know that the absorption rate tells us if we're in a buyer's market or a seller's market or a neutral market. Now, what's the key question we need to ask then with these two pieces of information? That's right. Which type of market corresponds with what phase of the real estate cycle? So let's get right into that. Again, an 18 year cycle between the beginning of the phase one to phase four. Now, so this is a bit of a misnomer, but Overall, big picture, if we're in a seller's market, we're actually in the tail end of the recovery phase and the expansion phase. Buyer's market, we're in hyper supply and recession. Now, why I say this is a misnomer is because coming out of the recession, we're still in the buyer's, we're in a buyer's market. And in the recovery, the on start of the recovery phase, we're still in a buyer's market. Now, only when sentiment shifts, like, like how I showed you that deceleration and that slow with the months of inventory graph. There's a subtle shift from the buyer's market to a seller's market in the recovery phase. And that demarcation um, has everything to do with prices. Actually, a deep, more deeply, it has everything to do with where, again, I'm not going to get into these terms. You can Google them, where the occupancy rate is in terms of the long-term occupancy average, because once occupancy exceeds the, the long-term occupancy average, that's when, when prices, rental prices, and even home prices start to really noticeably go up. However, when prices are strong and going up as they are now, we are in the expansion phase. And again, the demarcation between hyper supply and recession is when the occupancy rate falls below the long-term occupancy average. We won't get into that, like I said, but I want you to know if you study classical real estate, that's what they're gonna teach you. But I'm showing you really some proxies with really good reliable data of how to determine these yourself. So where are we now? We know, based on this graph, in Walworth County, right now, less than four months, we are in a seller's market. And we also know 
that prices are up. We had a huge acceleration of appreciation over the past year caused by the, the pandemic. So if prices are up and months of inventory is down below four months, then we know in Walworth County for single family homes, we are in the expansion phase of the real estate market cycle. See, I told you, just knowing those key concepts and having access to really good data that, that helps determine where we are at so we can better time when to buy, when to sell, when to hold, when to refinance, when to build, etc. All right, so what's next? Well, obviously, hypersupply, that's next. And that's what's great about real estate. It's a slow moving uh, wave that you see coming from a mile away. We know that prices are up. We know that we're in a seller's market. And we also know that the last peak in prices was in 2006. And we know that the real estate cycle moves in 18 year periods. So if we do some basic math, the next peak puts us right at 2024. However, COVID pandemic was a huge economic and life altering, obviously, a disruption. So that is going to alter and move that needle, whether it shortens it or, or pushes out that timeline or brings that time closer, that still remains to be seen. So the question then, when will then be now? And if you know where that question comes, what movie that question comes, bonus points to you. All right. So if you own real estate, you are a potential seller. Moves to make for a potential seller. What should sellers do in a seller's market? Well, they should sell. Depending on what phase. We don't want to sell in the recovery phase. We want to sell in the expansion phase. We're not, you're not going to need to make any big, I'm not going to go through all of these, don't worry, but we don't need to make any huge major cosmetic renovations because supply is limited, so you have a lot more wiggle room. But if you do have adverse material defects, you're going to want to consider fixing it. You're going to have to disclose that to potential buyers, depending on your state laws. But here in Wisconsin, if you want to uh, avoid a legal landmine, you're going to have to disclose that. You might want to consider, you know, giving, um, you know, your buyer's credit. It's up to you. Talk to, um, shameless plug, a real estate agent. They're going to really be able to help let you know how to navigate that uh, with you. Another, another shameless plug is, you know, you're going to want to talk to that agent because they're going to, uh, a good one who knows the area, who knows how to properly price homes will help you price it competitively. So it's not too high. It sits too long in the market, not too low where you have seller's remorse, but just right so that you can get top dollar for the time frame and context of the market that we are in. And also that really help through the contracting and inspections and other legal uh, landmines that there are. If you are not ready to sell and you haven't yet refinanced, now is the time to do it, especially with talks of rates going up and, and it is projected to go up. I'm going to do a series on different refinance strategies. So definitely stay tuned to that because there, there's so much more to it that meets the eye that, that can really help you maximize your wealth even further. If at all possible, don't sell in a buyer's market. All right. Now, if you're a buyer, here's some moves that you can make. Definitely if you have the means to offer cash offer cash. If not, offer conventional financing. Reason being, if you get two, if a, if a real estate agent has to present two offers to their seller, a cash officer or cash office, cash offer, or conventional financing, all other things being equal, that agent is going to push in the cash because they don't have to deal with a financing contingency. And it's just a lot easier all around for a quick and fast closing. Now, if you have to finance, use conventional financing with about 80% down because again, uh, over FHA or VA where it's you know close 5% uh, down or 0% down, the reason being, same thing. If a real estate has to present three different offers to their seller, 
One's conventional financing, other one's FHA, and the other one is VA. That agent, they have this, what I call a loan type bias. Um, the reason being VA, it, it's usually lower income, which is why it's zero money down. FHA, they're NVA actually, they both have very strict inspection requirements. While conventional financing, it doesn't have as strict inspection requirements. And it shows that that buyer has the means, if something should come up financially, to really make that deal work and, and hold it together. So the agent is going to push their seller for the conventional financing, all other things being equal. Even if the VA offer is higher, because if it doesn't inspect out, they're not going to qualify. It just becomes a mess. Okay, again, shameless plug. Uh, you're going to want to talk to uh, a real estate agent. A good one will just really get to know what's most important to you, what you need, and they'll put set up alerts. And that way, when the right home comes on the market, um, you guys can take action, look at the home, and if it makes sense, make an offer. Now, when it comes to making an offer, again, you're still going to want that real estate agent because they're going to help craft a strong yet reasonable and competitive clean offer that's likely to be selected, especially if there are other offers. And they can also help you negotiate, you know, the back and forth with inspections and negotiations, that sort of thing. So definitely you're going to want to consult them for that. If you haven't yet bought, and the market turns neutral, definitely don't offer over asking price. Uh, very simple stuff, I know you know. And if you still haven't bought when the market is neutral, if at all possible, wait for the middle to tail end of the recovery phase. You're not gonna get prices at rock bottom. The prices are gonna start going back up, but at least you know prices aren't gonna be depressed or possibly going lower. All right. So I realize this is a video. However, we cover a lot of content. If you have any questions on it, feel free, feel free to reach out. Uh, my name is Jade and that's my email right there. If you're looking for a really good real estate agent who knows the area, like the back of his hand, who's been doing real estate for over 30 years, which is one of the best real estate agents I've come across. Uh, my partner, Chris, and that's our number 262-204-5534 reach out to us anytime. That's our website. Now from all of us from Legendary Real Estate Services, we want to say thank you for stopping by, taking the time. I hope you, you learn something, you use what you learn, and definitely looking forward to seeing you on our next video. Bye now.